welcome to Allen Temple Baptist Church's House Insecurity, the Disruptive Impact on Our Health and Community Symposium. My name is Rochelle Buford Williams, and I am a member of Allen Temple's Health Education Ministry and Public Ministry. I'll be introducing your MC of the event, Reverend Jeremy McCants. He is a native of the little town of Sononia, Georgia. He is the 2013 Cum Laude graduate of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Religion, and also a 2016 graduate of the Divinity School at Duke University, earning a Master of Divinity degree with a concentration in Baptist Studies. Reverend Jeremy first honors his call to ministry at the Black Church and serves as the Minister of Prophetic Justice at the historic Allen Temple, leading the work of preserving and proclaiming the faith of all people in the areas of social justice. On the professional side, he serves as the faith rooted organizer of FAME, Faith Alliance for a Moral Economy, an interfaith component to economic justice campaigns led by eBase, East Bay Alliance for a Sustainable Economy. Reverend McCants also serves as the chair of Religious Affairs Committee of the Oakland branch of the NAACP and as the community liaison for the Board of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion at Samuel Merritt College. Lastly, Reverend Jeremy defines himself as a Southern gent dedicated to the liberation of all God's creation through the life, love, and light of God expressed through Jesus Christ and his favorite scriptures are is Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and statue and in favor with God and all his people. Reverend Jeremy, I turn the mic over to you. Thank you so much, Sister Rochelle, for that um, wonderful introduction. I didn't know I had put all of that in there and that she was going to read all of that. Um, but I am grateful to God uh, for the opportunity to serve um, and to serve in this capacity. Um, so uh, thank you again and to um, our health education ministry um, in partnership with uh, the public ministry uh, for putting on this timely discussion um, around housing and how that affects our health in every way. Right. Um, so uh, without further ado, we have an amazing uh, agenda for you. We have two amazing panelists who are going to uh, take us deep into the well, um, and hopefully we will generate some beautiful, beautiful conversations and hopefully some solutions together, right, um, to, to um, help alleviate and, and provide solutions to the problems that we see each and every day here in Oakland and the Bay Area. Uh, so I will, of course, uh, we are Allen Temple Baptist Church. Um, Hopefully my uh, Wi-Fi is stable enough. So please give me a hand, Sister Nubia, if I need to slow down or uh, anything of that nature. Um, uh, but yes, we are a praying church and we always want to start off uh, with scripture and prayer. So if you will allow me, um, I will read uh, Psalms 107. Psalms 107 verses 33 uh, through 43. Um, and then I will pray uh, for us. Uh, but the word of God reads as such, the Lord changed rivers into deserts and water springs into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into salt flats because of the wickedness of those who dwelled there. The Lord changed deserts into pools of water and dry land into water springs. He settled the hungry there and they founded a city to dwell in. They sold fields and planted vineyards and brought in a fruitful harvest. The Lord blessed them so that they increased greatly. He did not let their herds decrease. Yet when they were diminished and brought low through stress of adversity and sorrow, he lifted up the poor out of misery and multiplied their families like flocks of sheep. The upright will see this and rejoice, but all wickedness will shut its mouth. Whoever is wise will ponder these things and consider well the mercies of the Lord. Again, that is Psalm 107 verses 33 through 43. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and most of all, carrying out of God's holy word. Let us pray together. Spirit of the living God, we thank you for your grace and your mercies that are new each and every day. 
And God, as we go about our lives and we see both in um, intangible and tangible ways, deserts, we see deserts of sorrow, deserts of hopelessness, deserts of what is going on. But God, even in the midst of those deserts, you still create life. You create ponds of living water, springs of living water. And so for that, God, we say thank you. We thank you for life. We thank you for life more abundantly. And God, we just thank you for this conversation. We thank you for uh, the two that, that will take us into conversations. God, we ask that uh, you, we know that you have given them everything that they need. God, allow them to speak truth to power and to reveal that which needs to be revealed. So God, we thank you for everyone who will be represented on this call to everyone who is connected to everyone on this call, God. And we just thank you for your faithfulness towards us, um, even in moments of faithlessness. It is in your name we do pray and all of God's children said, amen. Amen, amen. amen. All righty. Well, let's keep this train moving. Um, I have the honor of introducing our panelists, our first um, uh, panelists will be Mr. Jonathan Fern, and now we'll read his bio. Uh, Jonathan Fern is head of development of Oak Impact Group, a real estate firm specializing in the acquisition, development, and management of commercial and residential properties. Recently moving from his position as managing director of Graystar, where he oversaw all development activities for Graystar in Northern California. Uh, Graystar, which is a pipeline of over 5,000 units and $3 billion in value. Prior to joining Graystar, Jonathan served as vice president of development at Summerhill Housing Group, where he was responsible for entitlements for multifamily, single family, and mixed use projects. Prior to Summerhill, Jonathan for M. Johnson, uh, Jonathan, maybe. Uh, for M. Johnson Interest, a development firm specializing in affordable housing and economic development projects within low-income communities. Jonathan is the chair of the Oakland uh, Planning Commission, a board member of Housing Trust Silicon Valley, Housing Action Coalition, Council of Urban Infill Builders, and a founding member of the CASITA, uh, let's see, CASITA Regional Impact Council, or RIC, which is a round table of stakeholders, convened to address housing insecurity and homelessness, and a technical committee member of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission's Committee to House the Bay Area, CASA, C-A-S-A. -A. Uh, Brother Jonathan holds a Master's of City and Regional Planning from UC Berkeley and a BA in History from Wesleyan University in Connecticut. So I present to some and introduce to others, uh, Brother Jonathan Fern, who will come to us in his own way. Thank you, Reverend McCants. I really appreciate it. Um, happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for this invitation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, begin to share my screen here. Um, so please bear with me. One second. Okay. Um, I'm assuming everybody can kind of see that screen at this point in time. All right. Excellent. Well, again, thank you for the invite for being here. It's it's an honor. Um, this is a topic that is uh, near and dear to to my heart for sure, um, and uh, it's kind of the culmination of of things that I've been working on, um, as uh, Reverend McCants mentioned, uh, for uh, a number of years now. I originally gave this presentation um, for a town hall for Supervisor Carson's office, um, and I was asked to kind of give a historical context um, of some of the broad scale conditions. Um, that have really conspired uh, to lead to uh, what we are seeing um, in our daily lives around housing insecurity and particularly homelessness. I just want to caveat that this is an extraordinarily complex uh, issue and topic. It's very interrelated with many other things. I think some of the things that we'll be talking about later today, and it only tells one portion of the story, um, but I'm trying to what I'm trying to illustrate here is, is one perspective on how we are where we are today. Um, and what makes the Bay Area uh, unique uh, in terms of other uh, metros around the country in terms of home homelessness and why we are seeing such um, abundant uh, homelessness on our streets um, today. Uh, so with that, I always like to start with this slide here, uh, because this illustrates really what we are up against. And um, this, what you're seeing here is in pink, uh, the amount of residentially zoned land uh, in the core Bay Area 
um, that you can only build one unit upon it. And so it's important to understand that uh, what we're looking at is really a vestige of, of laws that were put in place uh, 50, 60, even 70 years ago. Um, and then oftentimes intentionally uh, to uh, maintain the quote unquote character of certain neighborhoods, to keep people out of certain cities and neighborhoods. Uh, but this is a, a vestige that we are still living with. Um, and it reflects, uh, d despite um, the racial overtones uh, of, of this, of what you're seeing here, um, it reflects a, a population um, that was half uh, of what we of what we have today. So back in 1960, our Bay Area's population was about 3.6 million people. We are now at 7.5 million people. Uh, and so um, basically our our land, which is arguably our most valuable resource, you know, next to water, uh, is one that uh, just on the face, we are using very, very inefficiently in terms of what we are allowed to put on it. 82% um, of all residential zoning is designated as single family, meaning you can only put one, one unit on it. And it leads to these perverse outcomes in terms of segregation, uh, in terms of concentration of wealth and poverty uh, that we all kind of understand and see. But this is really the, 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 the foundation that undergirds it. Um, even in cities uh, that were around before World War II, a lot of that, a lot of what you're seeing there was was uh, was urban expansion after World War II. But even cities like San Francisco and Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, cities that were around before World War II, they actually took a step back after World War II and downzoned themselves. So uh, where you could actually build multifamily housing, they actually changed the the the, the rules and the laws to say that you can't do it anymore. So while this is um, a little tough to read, which basically what the the parcels in the in the yellow illustrate are are buildings that actually cannot be built today uh, under today's rules, but but existed because they could be built uh, uh, prior to World War II. Uh, these are some additional examples uh, from where I live up in in North Oakland of uh, these kind of house scale buildings, these multifamily buildings. Um, that were built at the turn of the last century, early early 20th century, but under today's rules uh, could not be built. Uh, in fact, what you can build is basically half uh, of what was what used to be allowed. And so that leads to um, uh, what you're seeing here uh, in terms of our housing permit issuances. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, they have dropped off dramatically, but a lot of the reasons are kind of what I just talked about in terms of what we are allowed to build and where we're allowed to build it. So uh, as you can see at the chart on the on the left, um, the state of California averaged a little over 200,000 units per year um, issued, uh, uh, permits issued for 200,000 units per year. As you can see, uh, starting in 2006, that dropped off by more than half to about 90,000 units. Um, and so we're not producing enough units to keep up with the number of folks that are actually coming to the Bay Area, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And the Bay Area is shown right there on the left, uh, really kind of follows what we're seeing statewide. Obviously, the Bay Area is is uh, is one of the major regions in the in the, in the state of California, so not surprising that uh, you're seeing that the kind of the same dynamic occur in terms of number of housing permits that the Bay Area is producing. And so this, what you're seeing here is kind of how we got to that blue and pink chart that I showed at the beginning. Um, as you can see, this is how we've built out the Bay Area after World War II. In the beginning decades, we built a lot of single family homes shown, shown there in pink. Um, but now what we're seeing, what we're, what we're up against today is that in a lot of those areas that we built all those single family homes, in that dark blue, we are building nothing in those areas. Uh, what we are building um, are high density buildings, high density uh, uh, towers, as you can see in downtown Oakland and downtown San Francisco, downtown San Jose, or we're building what we're calling mid-rise buildings, five to seven story buildings along transit corridors, Telegraph Avenue, San Pablo, things of that nature. Um, but we're really only building one kind of product type now or nothing at all. Um, and that one type of product type that we're building is this high density uh, type building. The issue with that, and, and this is something that I do as a day job, is that that housing uh, product type is just inherently very expensive. It, it has uh, elevators, it has it has complicated mechanical systems, it has a lot of concrete in it, which is a very expensive building component. Uh, I liken it to uh, us only building Tesla Model S's. Um, and uh, our policy response to us only building Tesla Model S's as cars is that we're basically asking Tesla 
to sell or rent a portion of the fleet that they produce every year uh, to folks that can't afford them, or we're giving people money um, that ordinarily can't afford them or, or, or lease them uh, so, so that they can't afford to buy Teslas uh, or, or lease Teslas. The, the issue is, is that it's a very expensive car. Why don't we try building other cars? And uh, we are doing this both on the multifamily and the affordable side. Um, and to talk just quickly about affordable housing and our affordable housing delivery system, our primary, our really our sole affordable housing production system is what's called, is what's under the low income housing tax credit model. Um, and I'm not saying that that needs to go away. Um, it is what it is. It is, it is, it, it, it is the sole really provider of, uh, of, of multifamily um, affordable housing, but it does have some limitations. It's extremely competitive and oversubscribed, as you might imagine. It's very complex to navigate that, what we call the LIHTC system. It can take years to produce. It's extremely costly for some of the reasons that uh, I just mentioned. And because it's so costly, um, it really limits the how far our subsidy dollars can go on a per unit basis. Um, and so uh, it, we don't we don't necessarily generate the number of units that maybe we could if we did things a little bit differently. Um, and to and to just to kind of drive that home a little more, um, I think this graph really puts it into context, kind of what we are up against. Um, the green bar in the middle there uh, shows the number of low income renter households that need affordable housing in the state of California alone. Uh, the blue bar uh, on the right shows the entire number of of affordable units that have been produced under the low income housing tax credit program in its entire history, the full 35 years. So as you can see, nationwide, we have built a little over 3.4 million units, uh, but we have a need just in the state of California um, of, 3 million, of 3 million households. And so we need to think differently about how we are going to produce a housing that is affordable to folks um, in addition to what we are doing um, in the LIHTC program, just because the numbers, as you can see, just uh, don't add up. Um, and so that's what I, that's when I talked about building something other than a Tesla, this graph kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. So on the right side, what you're seeing is those mid-ride building, those five to seven story buildings that um, we are, we're all familiar with. That is really what we are building in the core Bay area almost solely. All the way on the left were, is the single family detached homes. That's the other thing that we're building, but we are building that out in the uh, outer fringes now of the Bay Area. So uh, the Brentwoods of the world, the mountain houses of the world, and even if you go over the Altamont Pass, the, the Tracys, the Modestas of the world, but that requires folks to have punishing commutes to come into where the jobs are, which are here in the Bay Area. And so the question is, why don't we start to allow uh, some of these building types that we actually did allow to be built back before World War II, but now we just don't allow from a zoning um, and planning standpoint. Uh, duplexes, fourplexes, these cottage courts, you can see these in certain pre-war neighborhoods um, in San Francisco and Oakland and Berkeley, uh, but they in large part now don't exist anymore because we don't we have we have we have stopped them from allowing to be built uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and so these are likely to be building, these are the Toyotas of the world, right, uh, in terms of housing, right? And so these are inherently less costly building uh, types. Uh, they can be built for, for much less on a total amount. Um, they don't come, obviously, with elevators and um, a, a lot of concrete and that type of thing that makes them, that, that make them expensive. The cost barrier just on a dollar amount is lower. Uh, so you're not reliant upon institutional Wall Street money and institutional developers uh, like Graystar that I used to work for to deliver this house. This, the, these, these product types can ideally and hopefully be delivered uh, by folks in the communities themselves um, because the, the barrier to entry is lower. And so ideally what I would like to see is that these type of product types get produced and the, and the people that are producing them are more reflective of the communities that they're actually being um, delivered to. But zoning is just one thing, and zoning, quite frankly, is not unique to the Bay Area itself. I think we will see uh, a lot of other uh, metros around the country start to grapple with the things that the Bay Area has been grappling with for the last you know, 15 to 20 years as people migrate to those areas because they are currently less costly. 
Uh, but there are a couple of things I want to talk about, both on the national level, and then I also want to talk about what I think is unique about the Bay Area, and I want to do that just quick, quickly right now. So on the broad scale national level, as many of us know, income inequality in our country has just become more and more and more pronounced over the last 40 years. As you can see, um, the and as I think a lot of us know, the gains uh, that the, the American economy has generated have generally flow, have really flowed to the top earners, uh, whereas the median median earners and the low income earners they have seen their wages stagnate over the last forty years. So this is not something that is recent. This is something that has been happening really over the course of a number number of decades. But it does lead to these kind of eye popping charts where you're seeing the 001 percent of Silicon Valley households that hold more wealth than the entire bottom 50% of, single, of, of Silicon Valley households. It really creates this winner and loser economy, whereby if you are not in that um, in, the, in the households that are actually gaining and winning, uh, you are be fi finding yourself more and more vulnerable um, to the pressures that are uh, becoming evident here in the Bay Area. And then what we're also seeing is a federal a retraction of the federal government in many ways. Um, in terms of cash assistance, uh, certainly after um, the signing of the uh, Welfare Reform Act in 1996, uh, just the amount of cash assistance that's available to eligible families has plummeted. As you can see, the chart on the left basically shows that compared to 1980, it has fallen by almost three quarters. Certainly uh, since 1996, it's fallen by two thirds. So if you're, if you're finding yourself in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where you are vulnerable, there is less there is less assistance from the federal level uh, that is available than it was in previous decades. In addition, um, the federal government has basically stopped being involved in the market, uh, in the housing market altogether. Um, there is Section 8. Um, uh, that, is the that is the primary uh, way that the federal government subsidizes low-income households. But as you can see, it as a percentage of GDP, federal outlays for housing have has plummeted since the 1980s and has really never recovered. It still has remained the same for about 40 years. In addition to that, um, we have stopped producing a, uh, we have stopped producing public housing. I know the, the, the public housing uh, program, obviously there are there were a lot of issues with it historically, but it has been uh, the historically uh, the program that has uh, dealt with and and provided housing for the lowest income uh, individuals in, in, in our in our region, uh, and now uh, with the federal government pulling out of that, uh, those that responsibility falls on local and state and regional uh, jurisdictions to plug that hole uh, with their very limited dollars. Um, and so, as you can see, we peaked in public housing in about the mid '80s, and we are now falling off. Um, and some estimates were losing about 10,000 units per year uh, nationally uh, in our affordable in our public housing stock. So that's national. Uh, but what I think is really happening here uh, in the Bay Area, which sets us apart really from the rest of the country, um, is this concept of the superstar city. And this was this 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 term was coined in the in 2005, 2006. And what it really uh, uh, really references are these various regions in the in the in the United States. Um, that have been the recipient of um, the large, the bulk of uh, information technology jobs uh, and information technology investment. Um, and they have attracted large numbers of, of college graduates, high income earners, um, high skilled people. Uh, and what I'll illustrate here, which because I think it's important, is that San Francisco is an outlier. The Bay Area is an outlier, even with these various cities um, around the country. And I'll just go into it now. Uh, as you can see there on the left is a percent of our total uh, number of jobs uh, San Francisco leads um, uh, in terms of how many, uh, what, how, how much of the percentage of the local jobs are actually tech jobs. The San Francisco leads in that by uh, a pretty substantial amount. Of, of, even, of even more interest is the growth of those jobs. Uh, San Francisco has eclipsed all other U.S. metros by a wide margin, even New York City in terms of raw numbers and percentage uh, in terms of the number of tech jobs that have been created. And that is fueled by money. Um, and again, uh, the Bay Area, as you can see, is far and away um, the recipient of the vast majority of venture capital dollars that are out there. It, it, it is more than the, than the next three 
metros combined. And so what do those dollars do? Well, they create jobs. Um, and as you can see on the chart on the right, uh, the San Francisco and San Jose metros are one in three in terms of their uh, percentage of the job growth that they have, have absorbed uh, over the last decade. Uh, and again, that is more than the next three metros combined. And so what that does is, if you recall um, the, uh, the chart that I mentioned about permits, um, we have created six jobs for every housing unit that we've constructed in the last decade. Um, and even more shocking is that um, back in 2009, our regional governing body, um, Association of Bay Area Governments, did a projection of how many jobs we would need for the next 40 years, uh, and they projected 1.3 million jobs. That was actually eclipsed in this last decade alone, and so it just shows that a lot of these projections are just that. They are projections, but the, it also shows the number of people that the Bay Area has attracted over the last um last decade, and that has had uh, significant impacts on, on what we are experiencing today in our housing market. Um, there is a discussion about the Bay Area migration, and that is real. Uh, I'm not, not going to deny that, but there are people moving to the Bay Area. Uh, they just all happen to be uh, high-income earners, um, and this is what's happened over the last decade as well, and it has shifted the makeup of our cities dramatically. As you can see on the chart on the right, both San Francisco and Silicon Valley, they, they have doubled the number of folks that make over $200,000 a year in the last decade, um, where they're fully 30% of the folks that live in San Francisco and 30% of the folks that live in San Jose and the San Jose area are making over $200,000 a year. And so what does that really mean on the ground? Well, you know, somebody making $200,000 a year that spends 33% of their income uh, on housing, which is what HUD uh, housing, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development suggests that you spend on your on, on housing, they can actually afford $5,500 a month in rent, which is significant. Uh, but here's what they can't do. They actually can't afford a mortgage on a median priced home in the Bay Area. Um, that is kind of eye popping to think. So what do they do? Uh, well, we know many people do is they spend more than 33%. Um, and certainly as you go lower and lower in the income categories, that becomes even more and more exacerbated. Um, and then they also go to different, they go to counties and cities where the, the, um, the median home price is less than the Bay, the Bay Area median. So places like Oakland, places like Alameda County, they migrate uh, to those areas. Uh, to buy a house, um, and that's what we're seeing. Our housing costs in the Bay, in 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 Oakland and Alameda County accelerate, and uh, as the way we're doing. And what they also do is they stay as renters, and they start to manipulate the um, the rental market substantially. And as you can see here, no surprise, um, but because of what we just described about the jobs and who's moving here, San Francisco and San Jose. Uh, lead the nation in number of renters that actually make over $150,000 a year. And so how does that translate into what we are seeing on the streets? Well, the chart on the right, uh, the upper chart on the right, basically is a chart, it was a study done uh, by Zillow a number of years ago that talks about when a, community, a community's median rent exceeds 32% of a community's median income, that is when you start to see homelessness spike and become extraordinarily visible. Um, and as you can see, the two charts there on, on at the bottom, um, San Jose at 35.5% and San Francisco at 39%, we have crossed that threshold uh, you know, 15 years ago, and no surprise, we are seeing what we're seeing uh, on our streets. Um, this is an example of New York City. This is another city uh, that's had a very dynamic economy in the last you know, 15, 20 years and has not provided housing units. Surprising to me, New York actually trails San Francisco in terms of number of housing units that have been developed um, in the last decade. And as you can see on the charts on the right, the upper chart shows median income. Uh, the bottom chart shows the number of homeless single adults that are sleeping in NYC shelters. You can see that those two lines track each other very, very, very closely. So when you have spikes in income um, and you do not provide housing uh, to uh, to alleviate it, uh, you see homelessness showing up uh, right in front of your face. And uh, these two charts, I think, illustrate that. In Alameda County, you're seeing it in the same way, whereas the uh, median income of Alameda County has increased substantially since um, you know, 2012. Uh, we've seen our homelessness counts actually um, uh, spike um, 
accordingly. And so to summarize, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this is a confluence of events. It's a confluence of events. This is a very, very complicated topic. Um, it, it, it manifests itself in many, many different ways. It is a collision of national, state, regional, local factors, uh, but displacement, affordability issues, these are driven really by affluence. It is a dynamic, unequal economy meeting a sh shortage of housing and an inability and a, and a uh, an inelasticity in a housing market that cannot produce enough housing units to um, uh, to house the number of folks that are coming here um, and inserting themselves into our existing housing stock. And so, you know, homelessness it is not a it is not a result of of poverty necessarily. It's not a result of necessarily of mental health of drug use. Uh, it is a housing cost issue. Um, the state that has the lowest homelessness uh, per capita is Mississippi, and it is the poorest state in the country as well. So it's important to understand that this is a housing cost issue. It is not a mental health issue. It is not necessarily uh, a drug issue. Uh, we do not corner the market on that here in the Bay Area. Uh, and so the solution requires an all above approach. There's not one thing that's going to solve this, unfortunately. I think if there were, we would have you know, likely dealt with it right now. It requires housing at all levels. I'm not saying we need to build all market rate housing. I'm not saying we can subsidize our way out of it. We need to do both. We need to have a, a very robust response from our, from our government at all levels. Um, and we also need to make it easier uh, for the housing market delivery system to deliver housing as well. So what we're calling the three Ps, production, protection, and preservation, where we uh, increase our production. Uh, we do uh, renter protections uh, for those that are, are 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 vulnerable, and we try to preserve our naturally occurring affordable housing stock. Um, and if anything is to be said, I, I am hopeful about this. Don't get me wrong, because these problems are, are were created by policy intentionally in many ways, as I discussed at the beginning, and they can be solved in the same way. Uh, but I think it does require folks to be aware of kind of how we got to where we are, what is causing our issues at the root level. Um, in order to really bring uh, substantial change here. Uh, but I am hopeful that uh, we are sailing in the right direction at this time, even though it may not feel like it right now. Uh, so with that, uh, I will wrap up and uh, turn it back over and uh, take any questions. So thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Brother Fern, for that. Um, so we do have two questions in the chat, it looks like. Um, uh, the first one is, what was the reaction of the government individuals to your presentation? <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I actually did this twice. Um, the, the, the first time I did this, actually, um, one of the folks that was the head of housing for Alameda County asked me to come and make a presentation to folks. Um, they have a, a monthly meeting of, of planners and things of that nature. And, you know, I think Many of those folks understand the situation. I think what we are up against really is this is a political problem at this point in time. I mean, it's it's you know there there are politics that are behind a lot of the reasons why we cannot produce housing, and they're very very thorny issues. Um, you know, people, and so I think they appreciated it. I guess is the question is is the answer to the question. They appreciated. It, they understood. Um, and you know, and I hope that you know. In, in terms of their policy making, as 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 they go forward, they they start to implement some of these you know changes and rules. But they they understood where they were coming from. I don't. I didn't get a lot of pushback, if you will. Um, let's see. Uh, does the planning commission have a plan to address homelessness in Oakland? If so, what are some of the solutions on the table? Yeah, so it's a great question, and um, one of the things I do want to um, to, to discuss with, as relates to the planning commission uh, versus the planning department. The commission is a body of seven, um, you know, folks that have been appointed that really carry out, um, you know, what is what are the, the the planning rules that are on the books, and so um, it is really up to the city council, the planning staff, the mayor to make some of these changes. And we are pushing as a commission um, and certainly um, encouraging uh, different approaches and the different ways to tackle uh, homelessness um, in, uh, within, the, within the city of Oakland. 
there are changes afoot, and I and I and I will state uh, I am very impressed by what uh, staff has done uh, to date, what they're working on. Um, they they are laser focused on on homeless exits, and so providing housing for people to actually exit homelessness, not simply just um, have a, a you know a, a shelter over their head, but actually to um, to to exit homeless homelessness. Uh, so uh, they are putting a, a, a lot of money. Uh, some of you may know that uh, Measure U uh, passed in the city of Oakland uh, just last November. That was, a, a, I believe, an $850 million total um, bond authorization, uh, but $350 million of it is going to go to, um, you know, uh, affordable housing uh, and really uh, working on um, uh, developing housing for uh, folks at the very, very low end uh, of the income range. Um, so that that is happening. Um, and, uh, you know, what we're also working on um, is, is really a, a key piece that's missing is um, operational funding. So it's one thing to actually get some of these projects built. But for some of these folks, they actually do need wraparound services um, to, to when, when they actually do get housing to help them uh, stabilize their lives uh, and things of that nature. And so that's something that's being fought on the state level because it's very difficult for a city itself to actually fund in perpetuity some of these um, uh, some of these operational uh, programs. It, and, and this is, again, why I believe that the federal government has to lean in here, uh, because they are really the, 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 the player that has been missing um, for the last four decades, and they really need to lean in. Um, and I understand there's challenges to that, but it is, it is going to be a key piece uh, of, of solving this problem outside the borders of, of Oakland. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Um, can you discuss van lifers and where they fit in this discussion? Um, I'm assuming van lifers, um, those are what, what people are talking about there is folks that are actually living in um, RVs and and and, um, and 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 such. So, you know, I think that that is something that a lot of people don't realize about homelessness. Uh, folks that we actually see um, in um, that are having uh, mental health breaks that are on the streets, um, in tents or in doorways or wherever, that is really the, 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 it's only 15% of all the folks that are actually classified as homeless. And so, um, you know, they are, uh, you know, the, the van lifers are homelessness, are homeless folks. And so the, the, the goal is obviously to have a place, uh, where, um, you know, that is affordable to those folks. And I, and I think what, you know, what, what we don't understand about van lifers is, you know, a lot of homelessness is not necessarily caused by, um, you know, the, the causes of homelessness on a on a per, on a person basis is is very is very difficult. It's very nuanced. Uh, but a lot of what people are facing is simply they can't afford the rent. I mean, I'm, I'm I've been in Oakland long enough to know that, you know, back in 2009, you could find a, a place to rent in Oakland for 750 800 dollars, and now you know, that is most likely $1,400 to $1,500. And so that, what we are seeing is folks that can't afford that Delta, right? It's the erosion of the bottom level of the in, of the of the rent ladder that is forcing people into vans. And we are we need to create housing. I mean, that that's what needs to happen. Uh, but they are part of the equation because they are classified as homeless. So. Yeah, wow. Um... So many things. All right. The next one is uh, what impact, if any, did reverse mortgages and the 08 crisis play in the housing instability? Great question. Um, well, what it did is, you know, uh, one, one, there is the, the one of the many benefits of home ownership um, is a uh, a, is typically most folks have a what's, what's what's called a 30 year fixed rate mortgage, and that um, is backstopped by the federal government. I think that's important because, um, <laughs> you know, in essence, we all live in social housing. If you have a 30 year mortgage, uh, so it's important for folks to understand that you know wealthy people are being subsidized, you know, uh, in in a, in, a, in a very significant way uh, with 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 uh, with with mortgages. Um, 
And, and what it also does is it's, it, it creates a, a savings plan. In essence, you're getting equity in your house, but it also creates a stable payment uh, that doesn't move over the course of 30 years. And so when you got reverse mortgages, uh, what it did is uh, it put people into a place where uh, they were seeing their, their mortgage spike for different reasons. Um, it, it was just a different, it, it was a different game and different rule and it, it created massive instability and it led to people um, losing their homes in many ways. I think that that was, I like to say there were two great thefts of African-Americans and Black people in, since World War II. One was the inability to buy houses and fix up their houses following World War, following World War II. The second one was the Great, Re great Recession and the Great Financial Crisis uh, with these predatory loans where they, houses were taken back, taken back by uh, very unscrupulous uh, lenders and, 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 and such. And so, what it does, if you, when you get your house, when you get your housing taken, you're now in the rental market, and now again, you you become um, subject to the whims of of the rental market, uh, where you used to have a very stable payment. Now your payment, your your rent could go up, and 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 that's the, that's the type of thing, and that's very 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 challenging, especially somebody uh, who who's old or elderly who's on a fixed income. Uh, they can't, um, they they cannot, uh, they don't have the income to to really. Um, pushing against uh, rent spikes and things of that nature. So that's really, uh, you know, the shame of what happened, you know, a little over a decade and a half ago. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, another thing that came to my mind was uh, the color of the book, Color of Law. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Rothstein, right? Talking about absolutely. redlining. I know zoning is different, but. Um, yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's very related, though. Absolutely. Yeah, very related how we're still, you know, um, Still in the yeah. of a redlining, right? Um, Absolutely. So this is, I think, a more applicable question because just as you said, this is political. I do think as well that this is a moral issue, right? Agreed. It has, to, you know, it definitely deals with matters of the heart um, and, and in ways um, that we lack in caring for one another, right? Yeah. Um, so um, how can we as citizens help, you know, change the situation? How can we fight from kind of where we are? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the to me, um, the best way is just is really just to become involved um, in you know how you know Oakland, uh, Oakland, and in the Bay Area, they they have you know planning documents which are kind of very you know I, I guess to say esoteric, but being involved in the production of and, and supporting the production of housing kind of no matter where it is, I think is important. And I understand there are complications and issues around this. Don't, don't get me wrong here. Um, but understanding that, look, we have a very fixed limited number of housing units in our, in, in the city of Oakland. And what I believe is that we cannot stop folks uh, who are making more money from moving into Oakland. And so how, how do we do that? Anybody that's making $150,000 a year or more that wants to live in Oakland is going to live in Oakland, ultimately to the detriment of somebody who is not making that kind of money. And so um, so the the creation of housing and housing options, why it's become so fraught in, in, in the Bay Area is because people really actually can't live in the Bay Area if they lose their housing. And so we need to create some kind of, you know, uh, 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 some kind of reality where people do have the ability to to, uh, to to go other places if their landlord is 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 raising their rent or you know other things that are occurring and so leaning in and really supporting housing I I I believe and I know this this could be you know a little controversial but to me what's important about a city is the people I am less concerned about how a city looks than the people that are in the city. And if it means changing the look, the architecture of a city to keep folks like, uh, I believe on this call in the city, I am willing to do that. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. But the thing is you can, change is going to occur in one way or another. It's just, how do you want that change to occur? Uh, and to me, uh, I would rather have the buildings change than the people change. Thing. Yeah, I think my Wi-Fi is a little, little oh, wonky. Sorry about okay. the late. <laughs> um, so we we are at time for this, but I will. Um, if you want to respond uh, directly in the chat, uh, brother Fern, to, to some of these. Um, but I do think that the last one is. Um, I did skip one from Sister Lynette, and I think it will help 
help with the other two is uh, what is the working definition for affordable housing in the spaces that you that you work in? Yeah, so it's a great question, and thank you, Lynette, for asking it. Um, so it's it's kind of funny because you actually have it in your you, there's there's what's called capital A affordable housing, and capital A affordable housing is deed restricted subsidized housing. So um, the things that nonprofits build, um, the, obviously public housing. It's it's actual housing that has had some kind of public subsidy to it. Um, that is um, that that has been affordable for a set period of time. Um, then there's the concept of 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 affordable housing with a small a uh, that is produced by the market um, that is not deed restricted, uh, but things like ADUs come to mind, right? Where um, the the average rental price of an ADU in Oakland is like eleven $1 hundred dollars, um, and if you compare that to a one bedroom. Um, it's it's affordable, right? It's, it's it's just more and more affordable. So those are the differences. Capital A affordable housing is housing that actually has public subsidy and a deed restriction behind it. Small A affordable housing is what we're all really trying to get to uh, as a as a Bay Area, where housing is just simply more affordable. Um, we just don't have housing that is affordable today. Um, and uh, small A affordable housing is housing that is delivered by market by market actors. Um, and, and they're not deed restricted, but it's just affordable to a, a lower spectrum of the income of the uh, a lower household in the income spectrum. That answers the question. Got it. Yes. Awesome. So thank you so much, um, our brother Jonathan. I, I definitely, definitely learned a lot um, just regarding because we always, you know, our pastor, even, you know, she preaches it that, you know, um, what we see um, regarding homelessness and our unsheltered, unhoused brothers and sisters is, is not always solely mental problems. It's not solely, sure. you're right. And, and so having this context and this language around, no, these are the systems at play, right? We know that this is a systemic thing um, and not making sure we're keying in on the, on the um, how do we say it? Um, the heart of the issue and not the symptom. Correct. Right, right. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I know thank there you. were other questions. So. Um, if you can definitely uh, uh, answer those in the chat or respond privately, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, but we're going to keep this train rolling. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank I you. appreciate Thank the time. You. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. All righty. Um, so I'm going to toss it over uh, to Sister Rochelle. Are we going to do, are we doing the raffle? I think we got some. Yes, some we time. are. We have uh, right. three raffles that we will be um, hosting today. We will be giving out $50 checks. So we will be collecting your information. So let's see whose name comes up. So the way this works is we entered everybody who signed up for the symposium in this drawing. And when the wheel stops on your name, oh, looks like we have a winner, Teresa Tatum. Yay! We will have two more raffles as we go on throughout the symposium. I will turn it back over to Reverend Jeremy for our next exciting speaker. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Sister Osha. I feel like we on the price is right. Come on down. You know, I, that's what I grew up on. That's what I grew up on. <laughs> All righty. So next we have Dr. Lorna Kendrick. Dr. Lorna Kendrick, allow me to read her bio. Um, if my computer will uh, cooperate with me. Let's see here. Uh, so Dr. Lorna Kendrick, she is a native Californian with three adult children and three plus one on the way granddaughters. Um, who uh, she enjoys time with her family, traveling, hiking, off-roading, gardening, uh, DIY, do-it-yourself projects, old movies, and audible books. Uh, Dr. Kendrick earned her undergrad degree in nursing from Loma Linda University, her master's degree in child and adolescent psychiatric mental health nursing at Georgia State University. Woo I'm a Georgia boy, uh, so good to see Georgia repped in the house. Uh, she earned her PhD in nursing from UCLA with the focus on nursing, excuse me, 
uh, with the focus on nursing research. Uh, she has worked for many years in neuro, neurosurgical ICU and as an advanced practice child adolescent psychiatric mental health clinical nurse specialist, maintaining a small private practice while working in the academy for the last 27 years. As an academician, uh, she has earned tenure and full professor status, teaching, um, um, teaching interest uh, in research and leadership. Um, and let's see, and she has published um, quite a few things and is also heavily engaged in uh, community service. Uh, so I present to some and introduce to others, the Reverend, oh, I, I don't put Reverend on you, um, Dr. Lorna Kendrick. So Dr. Kendrick, it is on you. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, I'm worried because I hear the connection and I hope it's not mine. Um, so give me a way that for some reason it, it, it becomes a little sketchier or, or we're having some problems. I would just love to thank uh, Mr. Fern for his presentation. It was extremely informative and I really think appreciated the data that he shared and you know his discussion is a wonderful segue and a wonderful example of uh, looking at our daily circumstances and how that can impact our mental wellness um, and I and I think it's it, it really fits with what uh, Nubia wanted me to talk about when it when she asked me to look at stress and ways that we can, to um, address that, deal with that. And so I have literally, um, in using some slides I used with some tweaks to them, uh, the first uh, six slides or so are really some slides I've shared before at Allen Temple um, as a member of class nine. Um, but I think it's important when we're talking about mental illness, mental wellness, that we talk about symptomology, things that can occur, so that you're aware, so that if you begin to feel or see someone around you, certain symptoms, you know what to do. But in addition, you also do anxiety and in this world, um, be as healthy as you can from a mental wellness standpoint. So thank you so much for putting my slides up and um, I will start. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, um, just a few facts and I'm not as blind of time on these and if you have to be in, please feel free to add on in a sense what come what is where my compassion lies and where I'm passionate. I, I have two adult sons and a daughter, middle child. And um when I was thinking the night when I was first looking at my doctoral education in uh, 1995 um, it was interesting because, and it was really sad and it was really concerning to me because I had two sons and I saw that the, the suicide rate because of depression among young African-American men between the ages of 15 and 25 had increased by 119%. And let me say to you now, the data, the numbers, the percentage is still the same all these years later. It, it, it decreased a bit over time, but we're back up again. And you can imagine with some of the things that have happened in our, in our world, in our society recently, those numbers have increased yet again. Um, what I was seeing um, was African-American men being increased, increasingly given education at higher doses to treat depressive symptoms that were often at first considered conduct disorder, not depression. That worried me. So then therein lies this issue of misdiagnosis. And currently we have about 15 million Americans who are experiencing symptoms 
and oftentimes their um, subtle anxiety and depression, not enough symptomology to be diagnosed as depression or anxiety, but it's pre-depression, pre-anxiety, and that's where we want to be able to intervene so that we can help move that pendulum and help decrease the symptoms before we need to medicate. I'm about prevention. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, two out of three adults are on antidepressive or anti-anxiety medication. And one of the things that has always been thought but is not an accurate statement is people have always believed that children are not capable of feeling uh, depression, and that's not true. One of my youngest patients was four years old. And I think it's important that we realize that so we don't misdiagnose a child either and wait until they're an adult because the longer it's left untreated, the longer we, we give our bodies time to respond in a way physically often. Um, and so we don't wanna do that. And like I said, I'm about prevention. So next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So just, in, just I always love to use the continuum and give you some examples. And as a faculty, I was always a storyteller. So let me look, I want you to see continuum. So you see mental wellness on one end, mental illness on the other end. And one of the things I want you to understand is we often think about schizophrenia. That's what it, most people are very aware of. And that's really on that far end of mental illness. But there's so many things that come in between. For instance, you can lose a loved one and you usually end up somewhere in between in normal life. And we bounce back and forth. But losing, losing a loved one and that mourning and that grieving pushes in that direction of mental illness, away from mental wellness, what allows us to naturally move back into alignment, back into that mid-range and that normal range is our coping mechanisms that we're going to do some practice on later. So let's think about this. I remember when I lost my mom, it's been about 10 years now. And all she taught me wellness and and coping and that city of life helped me move on to over that and I mean moving as far as being able to eat again getting out of bed again when you start staying in bed or eat over are not eating enough then almost two weeks to say, give me a sign because I saw a little thing that said my, uh, my internet was weak. So I'm going to keep going. One of the things I wanted to share when it comes to this continuum is I always want to bring in the nuance of our lives as people of color. And I worked with young African-American men and I intentionally looked with those who were, had their social economic status because too often the data is done on low social economic status, but I wanted people to understand this is not, it doesn't, it's not only in poverty, and, and I know Mr. Fern alluded to that as well, but it's also with those who are more affluent, if they're looking, if they look like us. Those young men that I studied, overall, everyone, even ones that didn't know her, said that that depression for them was a fact of life they learned to deal with if they were Black and they lived in America. So that's just something to think about. And I think we forget sometimes what injustices do to us. And those young guys felt that way about depression. It's like, oh, yeah, it's there. But we learn, we learn to rise above it or it takes over and it can destroy us. And so for African-Americans not being strong enough, not trusting God enough and not doing something enough and not being good enough is also, also often, I'm sorry, the reason for saying they have feelings of depression. But I'm going to show you some other things that are going on sometimes in the body cause that really not these things. These are the, this, if I could only do these things more. So next slide, please. I was getting ready to try and move my own slide. 
Um, and I see a question about can depression be cured? Talk about that a little bit as I probably do this slide in the next. So thank you for that question. So these are just some, you know, illness. These are some of the, and, and I'm going to answer your question because Mr. Fern talked about and said that this really was a housing, it was about housing and not mental illness. And I do agree. You could have mental illness that's a response to certain neurotransmitters in your body, and you can have depression based on situations. And oftentimes when those situations are cleared up, the depression goes away. So that. And with treatment, depression, okay. so just to respond to your question. And finances, and we talked a lot about housing, chronic illness, abuse, and racism. And in my study, I'm going to give you, I'm going to share something because my studies showed that police stops were the number one factor for their feelings of depression and decreased social support and loneliness, CD4 levels. And when we were, when we first got on the call before all of you joined, I was sharing that what a lot of people don't realize is with HIV, we knew that CD4 levels were depleted. But what people don't often also remember are, are also equally depleted and that immune system is being impacted. So it's something to think about, right? And then the neurotransmitters, as I've mentioned, genetics, increased stress, stressors, and sometimes substance abuse and addiction. And let me explain what I mean by that. Often we have, uh, especially even the young men I did my study on, use substances um, rather than taking meds because they think it's going to help with the self experience. Um, next slide. Okay, there you go. Thank you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but I wanted to give you some ideas of what the symptoms are for depression. We often typically think about the sadness, but some of the others that you might not normally think about are things like difficulty concentrating, remembering, or making decisions. I had a client once say, I'm having a hard time thinking about words that I can use, and do you think it's early dementia? And it was really just some depression and anxiety that was causing symptoms. Those aches and pains, those headaches, the headaches and things like that can be a, a symptom of, of, of uh, needing some help with depression and or anxiety. Next slide, thanks. And just so you know, I'm going to share my slides with Nubia so that if you want to go back and look at some of these, you can at your own leisure and your time. So uh, here are some things I really wanted us to talk about as well. I never want to talk about depression and not talk about suicide because depression, there are two things that are that I've discovered in my, my research. Depression left untreated can result in suicidality and increased risk for early onset cardiovascular disease. So when we look at our own communities and we see hypertension rampant, it's often because of depression or low, you know, uh, um, sub, when we say it's kind of at the beginnings of depression, it can cause that sadness, that grief, and the, the, I, the thoughts of self-harm. And sometimes we've had, and this is just different and just a, outside of our conversation, but we also know that with people who have hallucinations and, and schizophrenia, we've had some times, and it's in the literature, where you have suicide by police, where someone goes out and, and um, without a, a weapon and they think it is, and sometimes it's been suicide. That's not what we in the news, but we have had those cases and it's in the literature. <clears throat> so um, suicide is, is a very serious um, issue. And it's sad to me when I begin to see more and more of our youth considering and thinking about suicide. And it's probably more um, 
evident than people realize that there, that many people have considered suicide or thought about the fact that they don't want to live. And my, my daughter mentioned something to me a couple of days ago as she knew I was preparing for this, um, this talk. And she was recently about a month and a half, well, maybe three months ago now, diagnosed with MS and she's 43 years old. And you start thinking about someone in their 40s, thinking about maybe in their 70s, not having full Um, ability to walk or move and, and feelings of depression and suicidality, but it's the pain because some have excruciating trigeminal pain and headaches radiating up that is not necessarily easily uh, managed. And that's caused in the literature uh, several, many people to consider suicide and many to actually complete suicide. When and I talked about on that last slide, pain. We have to be really aware and cognizant of that and, and take the time, and you'll see on one of my slides, taking the time to address it and not sweep it under the carpet because there is this belief that if you talk about it, they will do it. If you talk about it, you can help prevent them from completing a suicide. So just some other things to think about when it comes to suicide. Um, This person may have a mental health condition, which so when we think about unhoused, uh, we have to ask the question, how are you doing mentally and physically, right? Um, has money or legal problems. Uh, there's violence, impulsive behavior. Um, violence and impulsive behavior. People are more, more likely to commit suicide than those who are depressed, just so that you know, because that impulse causes someone to, to do something without thinking. And that's where we see those, um, sadly, we, we term it in mental health successful suicides. And then alcohol and other substance abuse problems, uh, easy access uh, to, to self-harm methods, such as owning firearms or medication, um, has a history of physical or emotional sexual abuse or neglect or bullying and be really careful to ask them, talk to them. You know, talk is, 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 the, is the key word here. Um, has lost relationships through breakups, divorce or death, has family history of death by suicide and is socially isolated or lacks support. Next slide, please. And here are a few important facts to remember. <clears throat> Depression does not have to be a fact of life. And that's what, something, that's what someone asked. I mentioned this, if it's left unresolved, depression can become the leading cause to death per suicide and early cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> Excuse me. Suicide is a result of unresolved depression. That's really important. And that's why I had it there a couple of times, because I want you to think about it. If you or someone you know seems depressed or easily irritated, stop, listen to them call for help or take them to a healthcare provider yourself. I have been in academe as, as um, Reverend McCants had mentioned for 30 some years. And there have been, I can remember five times where I've walked people to the emergency department. They were students, replied please. Um, one thing that I, because of my research and because of what captivated me, what I was passionate about, and because I had two young American sons, was the things that we overlook. Um, and your mental illness is misdiagnosed. Um, everything okay? <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's still Internet. a little bit spotty. So I see uh, your face, I'm just checking. Yeah, you're um, is if you're comfortable with going on camera. camera. Okay, good. Yeah. And we'll just Oh, sure. I'm happy to do that. Sure, I can do that. Thank you for the suggestion. Um, so what's missed is um, and what we overlook oftentimes is here's the thing. 
we, you know, there's a total lack of acknowledgement of the foundation of the racial divide in this country. And that's something that when most therapists are meeting with um, someone is actually reaching out for help, they don't think about that. They want to treat as if you're the normal person who doesn't have this background foundational issue to start with. And too often we see society, we see it every day. We're blaming the victims. And I love what Mr. Fern said when he talked about the need for, for affordable housing and, and what's happened in our in, in the San Francisco and, and how we're not looking at what's needed for those that are in need. But oftentimes I say we're blaming the victim and we're not giving those that those needs. We're not making sure those needs are met. Constant feelings of generalized anger, depression, invisibility, injustice, and the history that we dealt with. It's an ongoing daily, daily experience. <clears throat> Inability to advocate for ourselves, not knowing what resources are there, not having the energy to make a call um, or to ask for help. Constant exposure to system and stress, feeling out of control, fear and anxiety, refusal to fear of denying to a colleague just three days ago. And she's an African-American therapist. And she said, I just, she said, the, the reason I do this is I want to make sure that anyone who looks like me has the opportunity to seek help. And we are beginning to help more, but just not enough. And you know what? Sometimes it's just like, I think I'm okay, but I'm not sure sometimes just to have a conversation with someone is hugely preventative. Next slide, please. And so I just wanted, I mentioned <clears throat> earlier about the fact that when I started to do my research, uh, suicidality had increased by 119%. It ebbed for a while and now it's back up. And just recently, 2021, I was really proud to find this out because we need more data like this. My work was included in a systematic review in JAMA PATH for the idea that police exposures should be considered a critical determinant of health. You hear about the social determinants of health and how our environment and the things around us and the situations around us can prevent our best health, our best lives. And now they're looking at police stops being added to that. And I just wanted to mention that because it's new just in the literature. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Considerations. We, um, there, there's an increased risk for early onset cardiovascular disease. I've said it. Depression alters one's ability to make good decisions, good choices, and to care for oneself. When depressed, you're not able to listen to reason. So someone can say, I'm worried about you. You need to maybe talk to someone. It sometimes takes seven conversations like that before someone seeks the help they need. You are not always like to, likely to say no at important times. You might end up self-medicating, like we talked about earlier, overwhelm uh, issues and making poor choices there happen as well. Um, you are at greater risk for STDs, unplanned pregnancy, teaching, and you're teaching your children that depression is a way of life. Next slide, please. Okay, what do you do? <clears throat> Don't be afraid to simply ask a question. Don't be afraid to have a conversation. Don't be afraid to just say, I'm worried about you because this is what I notice and describe what you see. Pay attention to the signs. Prayer is sometimes not enough for a person, but I will say prayer will help you guide in helping them. So pray and ask God to help, God to help you with how do you respond to them? What do you do? Keep praying for them, but reach out to them. And in the moment, pray, 
then immediately go into action. Like I said, if you need to drive them somewhere, if you have to make an appointment for them, we've had students that we've sat in our offices and we made the appointments with them, made sure that they had the call and the appointment before we let them leave the office if they were stable enough to leave. Next slide, please. Okay, where do we start? General population, stop, just stop. And I want you, this time is for you. And this is something that you can also use with those around you if you notice some things. So stop. And I want you to think, maybe grab a sheet of paper because I'm gonna ask you to write some things down. But when was the last time you thought about your own wellness? And you can put it in the chat. I would love to see some of those things. Morning, I heard someone say that they had already done some errands, right? Has anyone done some wellness? Has it been prayer? Has it been a walk? What have you done? When was the last time you did something? Good, Lynette, I see your response. And then next, what did you do yesterday to support your own wellness? What was it? So yes, you thought about it today, but what did you do yesterday to support your own wellness? What was it? Did you do anything? Did you like um, a, a colleague and I, before I retired, we would be on our computers in meetings sometimes for 10 hours of the day, having to turn off our camera just to run for a vital break or to grab a bite to eat. That's what's happening in the, some of the work settings now. What did you do to support your own wellness? So now take out that piece of paper and make a list of 10 things you love to do. 10 things. Right now you can do five. We're, I, I still have a little bit of time, but we five things that you really, really love to do. And when you go back to that first question, also think about when was the last time you did one of those five, right? So once, and as you're writing, I'm gonna keep talking. <laughs> so now as you're making that list, and I know be, be, between now and the end of my presentation, I hope you have all your 10. I want you to make a list of three of those that you will do daily starting today. Three have to be daily. While you're writing, let's go to my next slide because I have some examples that I want you to also include possibly. Choose three or more from this list and add them to your list. I'll read them while you're writing. Find a quiet, dark place, closet if necessary, or go outside in your yard if possible. Go there and sit still for 15 minutes. And then I want you to, over time, try 30 minutes. Let's start with 15 because 15 is going to feel like a day if you've not done this regularly. Eyes closed and just focus on breathing in and out. And let me share something with you about the breathing. People always tell you to do those deep cleansing breaths, but they don't tell you the purpose and how it works. So when you breathe in, deep breath in, you hold it and you count one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, and then you release the breath. During that holding, of count of one to five, you will notice that any stressors you had, any thoughts that were bothering you, anything that was going on will disappear and it will not occur during those moments. And the more you do this, the more you can begin to help yourself deal with the stressors and the anxiety. I will tell you this, is when I find that something has made me extremely upset, I will count to 10, or even the one 1,000, two, now one 1,000, two 1,000 to 10 is a pretty long time to hold your breath. But I tell you, it works miracles. And in the beginning, you may find that you can only get to 
one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, because your body's not accustomed to doing this. This is one of the main things. If you don't add any other one, I want you to try and add this one to your day, every day. Then next is watch an episode of your favorite cartoon from childhood on YouTube. Now, I added this in the parentheses because a few times that I've asked someone to do this, they said, well, when I was growing up, we chose not to have a TV, so I didn't watch cartoons. So I'm giving you some examples. If you didn't have the opportunity to watch cartoons, choose Felix the Cat, my favorite as a little kid, favorite. Al, um, Fat Albert was my son's favorite, and Bullwinkle and Rocky I watched with my dad. So watch an episode of your favorite cartoon. Here's one that I often share and people find it challenging at first, but once they've done it, they find it so freeing. Stop watching the news for one week. If you have to try one day, if it's hard for you, one day, but get to a point where you stop watching the news for a week and watch how much your shoulders go down and you feel less anxious, less depressed. Draw a picture. Draw a picture. I said of something you would love to do, but it doesn't matter. Just draw some stick figures or whatever. Draw. The action of moving your hand and drawing is the most relaxing anxiety lessening and depression lessening experience you can have. Make a simple salad and sit without any noise and enjoy your meal. You notice most of the things I'm suggesting are to help you decrease the stimuli of your day and your life. Next, turn on your favorite music and sing out loud while dancing. Next, hug someone with their permission now and count to 10 before you stop hugging them. Once I had a, a client and the mom was very worried about her son, but mom was a busy mom <clears throat> and she liked walking on the beach. I told her to take her son with her on her beach walk and just sit on the beach and do not say a word just for about 20 or 30 minutes. She wanted him to talk to her and he refused to talk to her. And they just sat at the beach together. And then she hugged him. She counted to 10 and she said, ready to go. And he started to share with her from that moment he felt such love and peace and connection with his mom through that silent moment, sitting on the beach and her hug. Now, the next thing is you can do this. This is your homework, but make a list of 10 things you love about yourself. And if you have a hard time making your list of 10, get someone to help you with the 10. Okay. So, before, okay, good, thank you. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop for a moment just because I want to look at the chat and kind of look at what some of you have written um, and respond to, and we can always have, okay, great, thank you. Um, so now this is just um, in, re in reference to what we kind of, been discussing earlier before I started, but if you are unhoused or partially unhoused, struggling through food insecurities or anything else, or struggling with mental illness or balance even, the resources on the following slide are for you. And here's what I want you to please remember. Please do not suffer in silence. Reach out to someone for help. This can protect you from heart disease over time, meaning a uh, hurt heart from sadness and a hurt heart because you have cardiovascular disease. Okay, next slide, please. And important resources for everyone, talk to someone, whether that's a family member, trusted friend, or counselor. 
it is hugely important to talk. Make an appointment with a therapist if you're having any symptoms of anxiety or depression or sadness, or if you're struggling with getting over the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one. And I put NAMI, it's the National Alliance on Mental Illness on this on here with the number, because there are many um, uh, people I work with and, and friends that I know who have a family member who has a mental illness that it took them three to five years to get a good solid diagnosis and the right treatment to get them stable. And NAMI can help prevent that long-term. They could help you sooner. And oftentimes with NAMI, it may take less than a year or two. But oftentimes these families have had to call the police and all sorts of things. And NAMI is just an amazing organization that's helped many people. And then there's Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, they, they're on, you can Google them, you can look online, there's a helpline, there's all sorts of information. And finally, if in doubt, if you're struggling, if you're worried about a loved one and you don't know what to do, dial 911, they can help you in a pinch. And that's it. And thank you so much. And once the slides go away, I think maybe I can show my face and answer any questions you have. <laughs> Absolutely. And we love that. We love that. Thank you so much um, for your presentation and for yeah, just offering all of those things that get lost, right, in the business yeah. of life, right? Just the keep it simple. Yes. Keep it, you know, um, do what makes you happy. Do what makes you feel loved, what makes you want to love, right? Um, mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much, Doctor. You're Kendi. welcome. And it is important to keep it simple because if it's not simple, simple, people forget to do it or they don't do it. And if you do it every day, it can prevent depression. Please, please. I went to Cuba in 2013, and you know Cuba has the best healthcare um, prevention model in the world. And I did some studies, some work with some Afro-Cuban men, and they said, "Why wouldn't I get help?" because they think prevention. So if they feel sadness, they go immediately for help. And I want us to get to that point too. Thank you. Any questions, comments, thoughts? <laughs> they think prevention. Yeah, that is This is Deacon Johnson. Oh, this is Deacon yes. Johnson. I got on real late because I just come off another meeting here. <laughs> um, but hearing the last three slides, and I was just, just really kind of centered in uh, from, a, from a micro to a macro when it comes into our societal existence, especially living in these yet united, you know, and how much tension and pressure that the, the, almost the entire population of this continent is dealing with. And, and how do we find a sense of balance with self and respect and relying on one another and I was just thinking about what you were just saying these last five, 10 minutes, you know, just think of part of this was a part of language that was used in policy and legislative policy as it relates to what it what would utilize in um, reducing, as we talk about <clears throat> the police and that kind of thing, that nature of people who have these issues who are going through tension, and maybe not have been able to find a sense of self and balance and mental issues, right. if you will, this particular preventative, proactive uh, uh, language and, and uh, body of information could be utilized in the legislation to support def, you know, defunding the, the police only from this aspect. Mm -hmm. So they don't you know, deal with somebody who is you know, going through these, all of these the gamut that you yeah. just discussed. So, I just yeah. wanted to share that. It's very, so powerful. I want to. I just want to respond to your your comment because it's near and dear to my heart. When I, I have to say that um, when I was doing my research, my youngest son was of the age of the population I was um, doing my research with, and initially I went to a church um, to recruit, and <laughs> the guy said. You want to talk about depression? No, thank you. You want to talk about prostate cancer? I said, no, right? I don't want to talk about that. So I couldn't get anyone to um, participate initially. And so my son on a, on a walk, 
we were walking here, hiking family. So we were walking one uh, Saturday morning and my son said, that's because you need somebody that looks like them. You need to let me recruit for you. I said, I don't know if I could do that. So I had to go back to the IRB. They gave me permission to let my son help with recruitment. And he actually, he and another young man, and during my focus groups, I didn't facilitate them. I let the young guys choose two people and the two participants facilitated the discussion. So my youngest son actually facilitated the very first focus group. And it was powerful for me as a parent because I had to be a researcher and not the mom, but he was always pretty open with me about things. And, um, and what they did, he and a few of my, they're still part of my advisory board, was have conversations with the police. They had conversations with the police to help with changing the mindset. But I also have to say my oldest son for that very, I mean, was a part of this too. And he is LAPD and he is making a difference because he's aware of this. And there was a young guy who, um, I have to be careful because he's a professional, well, probably still a professional football player, um, nearly jumped and, and it wasn't in the news so I can share this part, um, was protected from jumping through glass and they, they, they pulled it, his friends pulled him back in time before he jumped through the glass at, I think, five stories up. And my son comes in and he's able, because of this, to have conversations, right? And so this awareness, you're right, the awareness can turn the tables. If just three or four or five young guys have been able to turn the tables in this way, can you imagine what we could do if, if many more were doing the same thing? Thank you for that statement. Yes, that's powerful, powerful. I do have one question in the chat. Uh, how can one make their current environment that they live in better for their mental health? Oh, turn off the TV. <laughs> that's really simple. I told a, a, a client, and I know, so I'm from SoCal, I'm from Southern California. I was in Northern California just for work. As a little kid, I spent all my, a lot of summers in Northern California because my grandparents, all their siblings lived in Northern California. So I always wanted to move up here. So when I came up here as an adult working here now, I realized this kind of, kind of constant social justice fight is never with, you're never without that. You know, we call it, they call us La La Land in Southern California because we play too much. You guys, I, re I said, no wonder the Black Panther started up there. And I had a cousin who was a Black Panther, right? But that, that constant battle is too much. And, and I know I've been to many of my friends' homes in Northern California, and the news is constantly on. Turn it off for a while. Decrease the stimuli for a while. Give yourself a chance, like um, um, Michael said, to get away from it because you need to build your own self-confidence, self-esteem, self-worth up without having to see that all the time. That just keeps beating us down more and more. So number one, turn off the TV and be in silence for a moment. You know what? I grew up, my parents, we were not Seventh-day Adventists but they sent me to a Seventh-day Adventist school because they knew academically it was one of the best at the time. And I love the fact, and I've done it for years with my kids, Sabbath, sunset, no TV, time to worship and be still. When are we still nowadays? Be still, turn off the TV, turn off everything. And on Saturday, Saturdays, it's my day that there's no TV until after 6 p.m. My house is quiet that whole day. That's kind of, and I teach my, grand. I have a little granddaughter. I have two granddaughters that are very Zen. I have two granddaughters that are not. And the, and the, the eight-year-old who's not from her, her house is always crazy with TV and noise. She comes to my house and she goes, Zen, grandma, Zen. We have to think that way. Zen moments, right? Those moments where we're, we need that quietness and think about Christ. When he got on that boat and he had to get away from the crowd, he needed that time to be still and hear God's voice, to hear the Holy Spirit. We, you know, Christians are the busiest people I know. 
you go to church, you have this meeting, that meeting, this. When is your time to reflect and be still with God, right? Still, turn off the TV, turn off everything. And the only thing you can turn on, like when my kids are little, is a little bit of maybe classical music to just soothe you. And when my son turned 11, he said, can I just use Sade? Nope. There are words that are going to stimulate you. You just need subtle music that's just going to relax you. Quiet and deep breathing. Hope that helps. Yes, that definitely helps. One of my <laughs> favorite movies, Bad Boys 2. I always do. I always tell people, whoosa, whoosa. <laughs> Remember your pressure points. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. And you know what? It, it, there's there. It may be. It may sound simple, but good choices when it comes to sleep and diet and exercise. Even if you can't, I remember my aunt was coming back from an illness, and her doctor said, "Just walk the length of your driveway. If you walk the length of your driveway, you drink lots of water, and you at least get seven hours of sleep. At least those things are hugely important. Making good dietary choices." and sleep. Yes, I see your hand. Uh, yeah, during COVID, that first, you know, that first three, four months was, okay, I, we went in it. Six, seven months, oh man. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at my wife, 35 years this year. <laughs> Eight months, my goodness, what are we going to do? So I took my boom box. I like going to Mexico for vacation a lot. <laughs> I took my boom box or I go to Puerto Rico or I go to Jamaica mm -hmm. and I went to the backyard. I put on, yeah. I put on some Jamaica sounds and down by the water, some old love uh, Spanish guitar and had a uh -huh. pina colada. And I went to Spain. I went to Jamaica. <laughs> I went to Mexico. Y'all can have this COVID. I was right there in my backyard. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's exactly it. <clears throat> and that, you instead of drawing the picture, you actually made the picture come to life. I love it. About a month ago, my um, younger son, I was at my younger son's house in the backyard and we decided to have a what, what I, don't, I don't remember what you call it, but kind of a music competition. So I would play a song and he would play a song. Right. We had so much fun for two hours. And his little five year old daughter was our was our um, kind of. Uh, the one that told us which was good. So yeah, right. So she, when I played one, she got up and she was dancing and flipping. And when he played one, she sat down and he said, oh no, you can't win. But those kinds of things that you do with your families or even with just friends or neighbors, my neighbors, I live in a cul-de-sac and we just went outside and, and sat for a while and just talked and just right the other day because it was someone's birthday and we just spent time. So time with people without the news, the TV, the stressors is wonderful. Think about, I think about <laughs> when I was a little girl listening to my grandparents and my parents laugh and talk about the history of our family. Those are moments that build you up, that make you proud, that give you the courage to go and battle another day. Whoa, my grandfather did what? My grandmother did what? My great-grandmother did what, right? Those are the things that, and, and oh, I did some, I did a brief study recently on the changes that being able to trace our ancestry back, how that's changing our mindset. And I think it's, it, it's kind of healing parts of us that have been broken for centuries, right? People are feeling so much better and so powerful and, and, and strong because they know where they came from now. We never thought, my grandmother never thought in her history, she knew who her grandparents were. She had heard about her grand, great grandparents, but who would have ever thought we could trace ourselves back to the continent of Africa? That is changing us and taking all this depression and all this weight off our shoulders. And if you haven't done it, start looking into your ancestry. It does wonders for your heart and your soul. Thank you so much, Dr. You're Kendall. welcome. Yeah, that's amazing, right? And that was one of the first <laughs> things they took from us, right? Our oral history. That's right, that's right. You know, that's so right. We have to reclaim, we have to reclaim our stories. 
Yeah. Yes. So thank you again, Dr. Kendrick, um, and as well as... Um, thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Um, to amazing, I told you it was amazing, amazing um, information. Um, just enjoyed the enthusiasm and the um, the preparedness, right, um, of, of, of not just having the conversation, but understanding how it connects to us as, as Black folks, um, and just how we can show up in different ways moving forward in regards to this housing crisis and insecurities and how that affects our daily lives, right? Um, even if we aren't directly impacted, we are in some ways. So um, thank you again. Um, um, but I wanted to give um, our health education ministry a chance to um, greet us or, you know, have any closing thoughts. No, I'd just like to say, you know, I'm thoroughly enjoyed it, enjoyed the presentation and blessed to be able to offer these type of things to our Allen Temple family and community. And it was just great, outstanding to both of you, Jonathan and Lorna. You know, I, I know you quite well. So we just appreciate you guys taking the time and effort to educate us. And this will be uh, online. So please share with your friends that it'll be on, on our website so we can disseminate more pertinent information. Thank you. And thank you, Reverend Jeremy, for, for hosting. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. This was definitely insightful, enriching, um, and I think more than all, empowering. So um, I think that brings us to the end um, of our time together. We need to pray. Amen. Yeah, so we will give you all, as you know, we say in the professional world, what uh, about 15 minutes of your day back, of your time back to you. Um, and I believe Sister Teresa is going to close us out in prayer. Okay, this was uh, awesome, <laughs> to say the least. I learned a lot, things I didn't know, um, nuances, um, you know, about that it's a very dynamic situation, the homelessness. Um, and it, and you know, it, it, it has um, arms that are far reaching, like this affects this and this affects this. So this was very awesome and, and, and an awesome, awesome morning for me. And I'm sure others uh, feel the same. <clears throat> uh, so I'm gonna do our prayer, our closing prayer. Dear Lord, we come as humbly as we know how, thanking you for waking us up today, thanking you for all our blessings seen and unseen. We thank you for your never ending forgiveness of us because we know that we all fall short. We thank you for our Allen Temple Baptist Church family that we continue to choose to honor you, God, by serving others in prayers and deeds. We thank you, Lord, for this dynamic, educational and enlightening discussion today. God bless the listeners, the speakers, the committee members, and all that had a hand in putting together this very important discussion. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the, un the unhoused, the financially burdened, the mentally ill, and anyone that is in need, prayer, in need of prayer for any reason. We pray for changes to be made for all that we mentioned. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen.